Hello everyone and welcome to part 5 of our Sudriar campaign. Now we're playing this to a short kingdom victory and uh, let's finish it off. Now, I am always interested in taking this all the way to Long Kingdom or possibly even Ultimate Victory, but I'll leave that in the uh, as a question for you guys in the comment section. Now, last time we were in the game, we finished taking out the rest of the Orkneys and you'll notice it all belongs to me at this point. So the only thing left to do is to head south and uh, raid and take the rest of those ports. Our objectives for victory require us to hold a total of 15 ports. We already have 11, and thankfully, we don't have to hold Diflin uh, to make this work. Now, that obviously, though, is a, a part of the Long Kingdom victory. Now, I do want to take a moment to make sure to point out that uh, uh, we had a, something of a celebrity status happen this week, thanks to the efforts of John John the Nord, uh, who, sorry, John John Nord, who pointed out that when we took the village of Erkadon, we actually had a very interesting little cinematic play on the side. Loch Ness actually popped up out of the water, bobbed up and down a few times, and disappeared. Now, as far as I know, this is the only stream or capture of that event actually occurring. Uh, but you can see in our last video at 59.33. Uh, so I suspect it's actually triggered when you take this settlement for the first time. So if you want to see it in your own game, that's how you can make it happen. So thanks to uh, the Eagle Eye viewers out there. Let's see, we have an army in the north, army here, who in pretty good shape, but we'll let them start to heal up for a couple turns. Upgrade them to their full axman status. We'll finish taking four true. In fact... Let's go ahead and get in there and start raiding their lands. And in the south, we've just taken this port here. Now, obviously, Thrones of Britannia has been out for a couple days now, and I'm really curious what you guys think about it. You know, I've obviously you've seen me play for a little while now, but how many people started off with a Sudriar campaign? Uh, or did you choose Wessex, which is probably going to be the most popular campaign available? But I think it'll be worth it to go ahead and sack it. <laughs> the animation never gets old. Just gonna sack that down. Our tribute is maxed out, so we can spend that on anything we want. Our supplies are looking good, so we've got at least a couple turns. We'll do a nice victory lap around here. I suspect this is our next port that we need to attack. And that one might be as well. Nope, they have jetties. That's how you can tell. They have jetties and docks sticking out into the water. So that's a nice handy dang little way of figuring that out. Uh, I think it might be worth our time to create a raiding fleet over to start harassing the coast down here, though. Now, traditionally, you know, the entirety of Sudriar always kind of went back and forth between independent sovereignty and being a subject of Norway. Um, obviously, you know, being right up on the edge of uh, the Hebrides right there, it's going to be the first places that anyone coming south is going to encounter, or southwest would encounter. Yeah. But, uh, you know, that's a constant back and forth for them trying to... Let's see. Yep, he's got that plus two commanding trait. Definitely want him. Enemy blood will flow. Soon, but not just yet. Ooh, we can really kit you out with a good army. Let's see. I have Fuscarls, Berserkers, Mailed Axemen. I'm a big fan of just two spears on the wings. Our foes will suffer! We will sword with sword. Hmm. <laughs> wow, they're so far away. I know good and well they're going to be absolutely useless to, to help out. Just to occupy. We already own these other lands, so there's no reason to cause issue. Looks like they're wanting to possibly cause issue in Torfness. There's no reason not to. Hmm. I'll let that rebuild, let them rebuild it for me and then take it back for myself. But Norway's troubled history with the Orkneys is kind of hilarious in a way. Uh, in 872, one of the big first kings of Norway, Harold Fairhair, actually wanted to extend his rule down to the Hebrides because obviously it's a series of colonies. Expedition, land of ice and fire. Your fleet has found a new and unclaimed land in the north. It's a place of snow and ice, though it also has fire in its heart. Your men name it Iceland. Perhaps a name like that will discourage others who may want to settle here and claim what little farmers avail. Chosen to find a new colony here or move on. 
Well, we know that Iceland works pretty well. If we carry further north, we'll probably hit Greenland and then probably the New World. But for right now, let's settle and let's send our next ones out further. And this man's working against you. Uh, really? How much influence do I lose? Ooh, that's a lot of influence to lose. I'll just pay him off. Let's keep doing what we're good at, which is... Uh, Kicking butt and taking names. Got a governor, got a scribe. Hmm. These three guys are apparently going to try and come and stop us, which is hilarious. Heading out! Enemy blood will flow! Glory awaits us! Just out of range. So Harold Fairhair actually sent one of his uh, trusted guys named uh, Kettle Flatnose, which you can only describe, uh, wonder how someone gets the name Flatnose, except for having been punched in the face so many times their land nose is just permanently flat. Yep. I wondered if they were going to come back up north. Man, the AI in this game is definitely improved. They don't mess around. Well, that's fine. I'll take these two really quick. Just a quick occupation. I'll take that one next turn. Gotcha this time. I have achieved greater rank. That is for true. So, the entirety of the Orkneys is now mine. The nearest enemy settlement is right here. We'll go ahead and set ourselves on that path. And send our raiding guy on ahead to get to work doing what he does best. But when Flatnose actually got down to Sudrayar and managed to pacify this rebellious land, uh, he did what Vikings typically do, which is he took it for himself. So, the King's Trusted Advisor wound up absolutely... Uh, the king of his own kingdom, which he called the Kingdom of the Isles. And that's really the first time that uh, the Orkneys become their own independent kingdom there. Good place to winter. Let's find our best troops. Go ahead and upgrade them to a next level. Not cheap, but I think worth the investment in the long run. Good place to winter, and then we'll take these guys out at the end of the year. That's going to be a good fight, I suspect. I apologize for not having more specifically to say about the Sudra or the region, but it just doesn't have very much information on it. Um, the only real source of information for this whole area is the Orkniar Saga, uh, a uh, collection of history kept from the Orkneys. But for about 150 years there, surprise, because they're fighting off Vikings, they don't have very much time to actually write this sort of stuff down. Ooh, plus the influence, plus farming for all regions. Only five turns though. I really wish stuff like that was a permanent buff, because it's just a lot more interesting that way. I mean, it's single player. What does it matter if it's overpowered? We're definitely putting the effort into it. Definitely want those rural who's Carl so we can get to them. Continuing to put together our little army here. It's a cav. We have another berserker. Can I get just inside the border and not lose rating stance. Ha ha. Good stuff. Just inside the border. And in the south, let's assume that they're going to come our way and meet him at the bridge. Siege defense. Never fought one of those. Let's give it a try. Don't think I can win, but I'd be very curious to see what happens. Got a couple of basic choke points, a bunch of siege towers, and a catapult. Let's assume that this area is probably going to be basically undefendable. And plan to go ahead and back up when the time comes. Yep, and they 
they're running catapults. Which is why I moved my guys out of the way. Don't have enough to really keep them off the walls. I definitely can't keep them from smashing that gate. Your fortifications come under attack. Right, and the next little bit I'm actually going to record as a post-commentary because I got so into the fight that I actually forgot to say things. Now, notice I put my archers up on this overlooking ridge here, and I'm firing arrows down into the approaching troops. Now, I took them off fire at will, and I turned off skirmish because I don't want them to back away if they get too close to the lines, and I also don't want to waste arrows shooting into the front. Because I know this is going to be a rather lengthy fight. But especially with cavalry coming up, hey, they're easy. Great way to soak up some arrows. Now, I did forget about defending this little point down here, which was a good move on my part, but I did notice that uh, the they're already circling around behind me, so it's only a matter of time. So the goal at this point is to take as many with me as I can. You'll notice I have spearmen fighting cavalry. Nice, easy way to begin the assault right there. That's a one-on-one, -on -one, and the cavalry's going to get it. So at this point, it's just about making these guys feel the pain as much as possible uh, for the main army to be able to get them afterwards. And I really underestimated just how fast those cavalry were. They're already at that capture point. And these uh, victory condition points are really no joke. Uh, once they capture that, you only have, I think, a, two minutes to be able to take it back from them. Uh, so, obviously, the bulk of my army is right here in a good defensible position. Uh, they're going to have to come uphill to get to me. My archers are making short work of everybody. Uh, but uh, no matter what, eventually we're going to run out of time here. So I send a force of axemen to try and deal with the cavalry and pull them back from my main line. But realize I probably shouldn't send my general because the general obviously gives a leadership bust, uh, buff. At this point, my uh, line starts to pursue other uh, guys running away because I forgot to turn on guard mode. But I realize the key to holding this mission is you have to keep that nice solid line up on top of the hill. So I reform them back in position and wait for the next charge of infantry to come. And I'm honestly surprised just how well these guys held here. It's a testament to the abilities of Suju Army, these Axemen are no joke. But in the end, this the entire defense was all for naught, because the Horsemen did get around and manage to capture that. But not before we put some serious hurt on the Goblin Hole. And we even managed to take out the enemy general, which is a huge blow. Good. Might win this yet. But you can't win a war on two fronts, and eventually, we were overrun. But they're weakened, and that's the main thing, because my actual army is coming up on them very quickly. Ooh, I forgot about Connacht. Uh, probably shouldn't do that yet till I actually recapture Kirigan. Okay. My warriors Let's make ready. them regret that decision. Massacre Fight the big them. army first. Move up! In Olden's name! which is overwhelmingly in our favor, so we'll just ought to resolve that one. You know, it's a funny thing. What we think of the Age of the Vikings is really not that long. Uh, in, in reality, let's see, 796 is when they attack Lindisfarne Abbey. From there, by 1066, the Age of the Vikings is over. Now, obviously, they had a heck of an impact in the meantime. They helped encourage the creation of new nations. They explored all across the North Sea. They populated Iceland, Greenland. Um, it, it, when we think about Vikings, we think about it as one giant homogenous group. But in reality, I mean, there are tons of different folks that came together for one express purpose, and that was raiding and trade. And so you kind of... In a way, they sort of took the world of Charlemagne and then grabbed a hold of it and just shook it around a whole lot and uh, ended up creating what we think of as medieval Europe. I mean, for the most part, the borderlines didn't change too terribly much after that. I mean, most of your major nations were in place. Always want some good axemen with these guys. Axemen are what they're good at, so we keep the axemen, if at all possible. Gotta keep an eye on Connick there, who's coming towards our base. Continue raiding our way southwards here. The Vikings pretty much forced England to consolidate into one major kingdom. Uh, they brought about the unification of Norway, of Sweden, of Denmark. Uh, even France, uh, who had previously been one giant state, sort of split off into smaller pieces because they had to, you know, it, it really, like I said, just shook up the whole world there. Hmm. 
Annexed by Difflin. Well, I'm not Difflin. Doesn't help me. Still want a governor. Still not happy doing that yet. We will bring you glory. Smash After them. this, I will be. On and this is glory. their king. So. Hmm. Bad news, pal. Yeah, my uh, king's getting a little old, though. You can tell with the, that white hair. That's one of those things people always think about. Uh, back in the Middle Ages, everybody died super young. Kind of, yes, and you know, no. When they say that everyone died super young, you have to, the first question you have to ask is, uh, well, are they counting infant mortality? Now, infant mortality, if you're not aware, is uh, back in the day, pretty much every bit, something like 25 to 50 percent of all children died. Uh, it was a very high number. Uh, I think it's like, yeah, 25 to 50. I, like I said, it's off the top of my head, so I can't quite recall. But basically, if you're a baby, it's very hard to live to adulthood. Uh, if they could make it past the first eight years, actually something like 90% of them live to adulthood, barring, you know, disease epidemics, things like that. But that we first several years, especially the first five, are just so detrimental to the population. And people forget about the impact that vaccination has had on just uh, the population of the world. Um, infant mortality has always been the big concern, not adults for the most part, barring some sort of really terrible outbreaks. This is not as common. Your healthy populations like that. So when they say the average lifespan was 35, well, typically they're taking infant mortality. So if everybody dies at zero and other people live to 60, 35 is pretty much in the middle. But once you, if you were going to live to adulthood, you were typically going to live to a good old age of 50, 60, something like that. I mean, people forget the the age of uh, the, the modern death age, uh, mortality age, is uh, only 75. You know, it's a little older for ladies, I think two or three years older. Not really sure why. Uh, there's a lot of theories on that one that I won't get into, but uh, where did Connacht go? Connacht had ships. They were in the ocean. I saw them. Um, not going for us. Okay. I'm all right with that. Just uh, didn't expect it. Finish putting this army together here. Well, you know, considering we have a tribute to spare, uh, doubling our campaign movement range for a little bit Success would be really morning. stinking useful right now. We are trying to move around, and we can get Who's Carl's finally. Whew. I'm all right with that though, because Who's Carl's are awesome. So the Viking Age, uh, into the Viking Age, happened to coincide. If you can imagine, the Earth goes through periods of heating and cooling, right? So you have your ice ages, things like that, and the Middle Ages. This is what we call the medieval warm period, right? Expedition under attack. We're used to rush for their weapons, ready to defend the ships, or should they flee from this threat? Well, we're badasses, and we don't back down, so we always fight the enemy if possible. Minus two loyalty, plus she gets zeal and influence. I think wives affect loyalty a lot in this game. Not a lot of positive abilities from them. Why not? I mean, he's still basically loyal. It's just sort of a hot... It's called the, uh, so, like I said, it was called uh, Medieval Warm Period. Medieval Warm Period begins roughly around 66, lasts until late 1300s, right? If you can imagine cooling, heating, cooling, heating. Now, in the warm periods, um, everything grows a little better. Uh, dumb to say, but true. And so if you have more things able to grow, you have more food, which leads to population surpluses, right? Population surpluses lead to larger societies, and larger societies typically lead to advancements in society. Um... So it, it's no coincidence that after, as the medieval warm period starts to come down, we also happens to have the Renaissance right there after 300 years of, you know, people able to finally not worry about feeding themselves. Oof, they recruited a big army overnight because they knew I was coming. Unfortunately, it's not going to be enough because everything takes time to muster right now. Whew, too bad there, guys. Nice try, though. Punisher, oh, guys. So the the Viking raids actually come right at the deepest part of the cooling period. So there's less food, less land, less everything. Um, and basically, it's that scarcity that theoretically made it so that they were forced to begin raiding uh, the Vikings themselves. 
and it's one of those things people don't think about, but you know, the weather actually impacts uh, how nations develop. You know, if you don't have enough food to actually feed everyone, well then people have to figure something out. They're not just gonna die, people like to survive. Ooh, Eidenberg. This is one of the weirder things about Total War, is once you kind of get going, it's a lot, um, it's rarer that you're going to see uh, people getting in your way. So in this case, obviously, we're kind of starting to snowball. So the Short Kingdom victory will probably be coming up pretty soon, because, I mean, that was definitely a port. <laughs> Looks like Stuck Berlin is. So we'll finish off these guys and then move the other direction. Our foes will suffer! Strike now! <laughs> they keep crowning kings, I keep chopping off their heads. One of us is getting it tired. I was talking earlier about Norway having controlled a lot of the Orkneys previously. And, you know, that's one of those weird things. When they think about Vikings attacking, well, typically it wasn't Vikings, it was the people of Norway. Sure, they were acting as Vikings, you know, pirates in this case. But, uh... It's not quite the same thing, is it? Uh, and that's what I was saying, by the end of the Viking Age, all these nation-states are being created. I mean, originally, there's disparate tribes of uh, Vikings, and uh, by the end of it, they've all kind of joined together. Yeah, Connick decided to uh, take that location there, didn't it? Well, let's just start raiding their land, shall I? Get to that little pinch point right there, because we know they're going to start heading north, and then we can uh, cut them off before they get there. Give us a chance to heal up for a turn or so. Maybe throw in an additional good unit. Another cab. Works for me. And uh, by the time they get there, I'll be ready to rock and roller. Can assign a governor. Kirkin needs a governor. Horseman and madman. I know what I want from my uh, generals, or my governors. Madmen, obviously. Not very many good governing traits with Sudriar. Shouldn't really be surprised, I suppose, after all they are Vikings, but, uh, what you gonna do? Ooh, what happened to my economy? It just tanked. Alrighty, so I gotta get these guys out the door and moving, otherwise... We are going to be S-O-L really quick here. We need to start raiding lands fast. <laughs> See how fast we can start attacking these places and hop frog along here. Yep, I'm bankrupt. I already knew that. The treasury is bad. Bank yep, and in a very few short amount of time, people are going to start revolting because of that. So I got to spend some time investing in economy, it sounds like. I hate to just destroy these villages, but what are you going to do, you know? So, let's do what we do best. And screw some folk up. Sack. Good. I'll just climb to go this way, then. Your treasury is running dry. You need to increase income before wow, your we faction were runs out of money. Of course we were. Beware of bankruptcy. Who knows why? For it leads to unrest at home. Mm-hmm. I know. Unrest everywhere. Yep, you gave me that hint really strongly. Enemy blood will flow. So we can go ahead and take this guy. And that should help our bankruptcy issue. Ooh, actual defense on this one. Jeez. Did not realize they had quite so much uh, helping them out right there. We serve to the end. Glory awaits us. Thunder and glory. Yes. Pushing is worth next to nothing. Man alive. We are just burning income right now. That second army may not have been a great suffer. idea as I thought it was. You can't fight real quick. March on. Attack. It's one of those weird questions of uh, 
How can you tell somebody was a Viking? You know, it sounds odd to say, but especially with Viking culture, I mean, it's like a job like anything else, I suppose. And uh, every male, for the most part, was buried with spears. Or buried with a spear, buried with a weapon of some kind. You know, the upper status individuals were buried with uh, swords, things like that. But for the most part, we don't want to run right now, folks. I'll just walk. Why are we still running? There we go. So it's one of those weird things, you know, when they find a burial, can you tell if it's a Viking or not? Well, what does it have with it? <laughs> you know, you try and look to figure out. We have horse boys. General who is a horseman. Let's plan to put some arrows and feather him pretty good. Alright. Hold up, folks. I need you guys to flank more than I do anything else. Skirmishers, we're not going to be able to do much. Trying to keep my archers to hold back any of his archers. Uh, use my cavalry to flank for the most part. Let's let them keep running down any of these little guys like this. My main line's doing excellent. These axemen just eat through other swords. Um, in a 1v1, yeah, they may take more damage, but they're just going to punch right through any armor they encounter. And that's one of those things that it's kind of hard to put a value on. That's everybody. And this is just one of those interesting little points. So if you've ever heard of battlefield archaeology, um, the idea that you can go to a battlefield and dig things up, and it's always one of those big questions. Like, yeah, every year you'll see an article about, hey, where's the Battle of Hastings? Or, hey, where was Richard III killed? Well, we don't really know. <laughs> 
Everyone's like, oh, but a big battle took place there. I mean, you should be able to find that, right? No. Um, <laughs> one of the greatest details I can tell you is if you ever look at the bottom of the Bayou Tapestry, you'll see a bunch of people looting the dead bodies. Um, and the reason being, anything of value that was left on the battlefield at the end, people would kind of run off with. I mean, leather, weapons, swords, horses, you name it, they're going to try and take it. I mean, after you've beaten someone, you're obviously not going to leave things for them to pick up later. God, this is just not working out. That second army, while a good idea, it's just costing too much to upkeep. Let's see, I need to remove six or seven guys. So, we were talking earlier about where the natural caps on you. And apparently, um, can't have too many elite guys just because it costs too damn much to keep them up. I hate to do that, but anything less, and I'm just not going to be able to stay solvent. Oof. I didn't have friendly territory for that, though. You know what? I'm here right now. Break the siege. Attack all Clute, which may be a port, can't tell. Yep, I was right, there's a port. Oh, that's 15. That may be the end of our kingdom victory, actually, folks. So what I was saying about battlefields, though, is that, you know, any kind of chain mail, stuff like that, it's just not going to be left behind. So you may find a few little scraps, you may find a horseshoe or two, you may find a couple of arrowheads, uh, but much beyond that, there's just not a heck of a lot left behind for you to actually discover. And that's it. That's our first a true victory. King leads from the front by his deeds and noble example. Goodness. By your hand, the people are united, joined at last in common cause. The annals of history will talk of your deeds in reverence of this great feat. All hail. <laughs> that feels pretty good, I'm going to be honest. So, uh, that is the Short Kingdom victory. We are now the faction of Loch Lawn. Hmm. I don't know what that means. That's rather interesting. I'm going to click Continue Campaign because I want to save right here. Uh, but overwhelmingly, you guys voted for a Wessex campaign. Now, I just mentioned the Battle of Hastings a minute ago, and I have to admit to you, this is the one that I'm most excited about, and this is one that's definitely going to play all the way to Ultimate Victory. Uh, because it's the one I know the most about. So, like, <laughs> I was kind of hitting the bleeding edge of what I knew about Sujirai right there at a couple points. Hmm. All these Viking ships. It's all right. We'll go southeast just because. Short King to Victory. Your faction is now called Loch Lawn. I wonder why. Let's find out. Google, as usual, provided a very quick answer. Now, Loch Lawn is the Gaelic word for Scandinavia or Norway. As it says, it's a word that means land of lakes or land of swamps. And the word specifically refers to the Nordic realms of Europe, meaning the Hebrides, the places that we just actually united. It's just another really nice detail. I'm constantly surprised by just how much research has gone into this game, and I've enjoyed playing it so far. But what I think really doesn't matter as much. The question is, what have you guys thought so far? You've had a week with it. Have you been enjoying it? Um, leave your comments below. I want to hear how many people have tried out Suryar. Did you have the same campaign I did? Did you fight Kirkin? Did you... Uh, end up having to take out the Orkneys, or did you stay with your ally and take over all of it for yourself? The next thing you'll see from me is a Wessex campaign where we actually go and take the fight to all of England. I've been considering actually trying to do this live, either via Twitch or YouTube gaming. It's always weird trying to come up with facts off the top of my head, and I find that you guys have a lot of interesting questions, so it might be better if you just had the opportunity to just type it in at the time and uh, ask me live. So if you think that's something you'd be interested in, or if you prefer this pre-recorded format, uh, weigh in below. And I wouldn't keep doing it if you guys weren't actually viewing it, so... Thanks for watching, guys. I've been having a really good time doing this, and uh, look forward to doing the next bit of campaign with you.